please help me welcome the author of the number one New York Times bestselling memoir, Wild. The New York Times bestseller's Tiny Beautiful Things, Brave Enough and Torch. Her books have been translated into 40 languages around the world. Wild was chosen by Oprah Winfrey as her first selection for Oprah's Book Club 2.0. The Oscar-nominated movie adaption of Wild stars Reese Witherspoon as Cheryl and Laura Dern as Cheryl's mother, Bobby. Strade's essays have been published in the Best American Essays, the New York Times, Washington Post Magazine, Vogue Salon, The Sun, Tin Roof, a Tin House, and that was a little B-52s moment, <laughs> um, and elsewhere. Strade was the co-host along with Steam Almond of the Dear Sugar podcast which originated with the advice column on the rumpus. Sher Strayed, who lives in Portland, holds an MFA in fiction writing from Syracuse University and a bachelor's degree from the University of Minnesota and a very special place in my heart. Please welcome Cheryl Strayed. Okay, that didn't make me cry at all. <laughs> oh, Kara, thank you so much. I have genuine admiration for you. Have all of you read her books, Gorge and the Weight of Being? Yes? Awesome. She's really, truly one of my heroes. And I knew that from the beginning when I met her in Chamonix, France, at that amazing workshop, that, that wondrous three weeks where we got to have croissants every day. Um, we... One of the things that struck me about her writing immediately was how, how boldly she told the truth. And I told her when I read the first pages of hers that I read in, in, that became Gorge, is that really I had, you know, she was telling me a story that I'd never heard, that I'd never heard anyone tell about themselves. And it was, when we hear that, it's one, that's a story that needs to be told. Right? Because of course what I know when I see the truth on the page, when I see that kind of courage um, in life or in writing, a whole bunch of people are going to gather around that uh, voice, that story, and say, me too. We've seen that happen in every way. It's the history, really, of the world. When we speak our truth, people gather around us and, and tell us that it's their experience too. So I just want to say thank you for, I'm so honored that you count me among your heroes, Kara, because you are certainly one of mine. Okay. I am going to talk to you today about, um, you know, really I think what, what Kara's books are about, what my books are about, what so many uh, of our lives are about is really uh, that, that journey to heal, that journey to enlightenment and transformation and healing, finding again that wholeness um, within us that I think that we were all, that we all began that way. Uh, but sometimes along the way, things break us, right? And we lose course. My uh, sort of that moment that we think of as the broken moment or the bottom moment happened for me when I was 26 and I was driving along a road in Minnesota in a snowstorm, and I realized that I had ruined my life. I was young enough to think that that was possible, that, um, that, you know, that it was over for me. Uh, one of the great things that age has taught me, I, I'm 50 now, I just turned 50 last month, is that you know, pretty much um, it's almost impossible to actually ruin your life, right? Um, the great thing about going off the track is you can always find your way back, and usually uh, more powerfully than before. In my case, what had happened is my mom had died, which um, really in so many ways made me feel like I had died too. I had grown up um, really uh, in poverty. My mother ha as, had gotten pregnant as a teenager, married my father, and spent about a decade of her life in an abusive relationship, being battered. Um, my, my father was violent. He was uh, uh, you know, emotionally abusive, sexually abusive, physically abusive. And my earliest memories as a child are of that kind of terror, that kind of tyranny. And I think that one of the most important things when I think about my journey to transformation and enlightenment is really um, connected to my mom's journey when my mom finally found the way out of that marriage and the way out of that relationship, when my life 
uh, was finally free of this man who was an abuser. And really, when I think about the, the, the course my life has taken, the things I wrote about in Wild, so much of it really traces back to my mom's resilience and my mom's courage. I, I probably don't need to tell you all that you know we're pretty new as a culture at having any understanding of domestic violence. Um, in, 19, in the early 70s, when my mom was repeatedly fleeing my father, there was actually no place to go. The, the first domestic violence shelter in this nation opened in 1975, which is a fact that always shocks me. Uh, we drove around and waited till my father calmed down, and then we went the only place we had to go, which was back home. And the culture told my mom that it was her job to make it better, uh, that it was her, maybe her fault that, that my father was behaving in those ways. And you know, to see my mother reject that story and blaze a new trail for herself as a single mother of three kids. You know, she's in her late 20s, she had three kids under the age of, of nine. And she made a life for us in Minnesota. And we had, those of you who've read Wild, how many of you have read my book Wild or seen the movie? Okay. Um, Laura Dern playing my mom. I, you know, people used to always ask me, if your mom could come back to life and you could say one thing to her, I used to always say, it would be, I love you, mom. Thank you so much for everything you gave me. And now it would be, Laura Dern played you in a movie. <laughs> because she would not believe it. My mom was five feet tall and brunette, and all her life she wanted to be a tall, willowy blonde. And so we got the tallest, most willowy blonde in Hollywood to play her um, in a movie. But you know, she, um, we, we, we had this, this life of you know, single momhood. My, that era of my childhood from about you know, six to, to my early teen years. I think of it as not just a happy one, but an incredibly powerful one when it comes to uh, mentorship, essentially. Imprinting in me, um, the sense that I was strong, that I, that I could be strong enough to make my own life because I was watching my mom do it. And she, it, there were all kinds of things that were hard. It's not easy to grow up in poverty. We had a lot of struggles and a lot of strife, but we had a lot of love and a lot of joy. And only later in my adult life did I realize how powerful, how powerfully important that was. My mother would always say to me and my siblings when we complained about things, wanting things, she would say, you know, we aren't poor, we're rich in love. And I would roll my eyes at her. She was a font of positive aphorisms, <laughs> which, you know, nobody wants their mother to be. Um, but it ends up being kind of true in the end, because we did have those riches. By the time I was a teenager, we were living in northern Minnesota, um, in the woods, 20 miles from the nearest town of 400 people, and we didn't have electricity or running water or indoor plumbing, which is FYI, not the way I wanted to live when I was 14. But, and my mom would say another aphorism, you'll thank me later, this is character building, um, <laughs> which another thing made me furious, but I, I realized she was right. And at the, you know, in those years that I was growing up, the thing that, the, the, the story that, the truth that was rising in me was that I felt really called to be a writer. I fell in love with books the minute I learned how to read, and I found in them the power of story. The, 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 the thing that would end up being my guiding light, my greatest consolation when times got rough. As a kid, what it felt to me was beauty and truth and I felt pierced with it. I didn't know someone like me could go into the world and become a writer, but I knew that I wanted to, 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 see, to see what would happen. I, wa I wanted to spend my life making truth and beauty through language and story on the page. And so when I was a teenager, it was certainly, there was nobody around me saying, um, you know, anything about like studying for my SATs or how to get to college or any of those things. I was raised in a culture actually completely marooned from all of that. It was only when I went off to college and my peers would talk about having gone on college tours or things like this that I even heard of such a thing. Um, but at the time, I knew that my path to writing was certainly to get the hell out of Dodge. Uh, so when I was a senior in high school, I lined up, I started getting brochures in the mail for colleges, and I lined them up on the kitchen table, and, and I, it was my understanding that I was to, this was 
essentially the way to choose where to go to college. I didn't know that I was meant to apply to more than one school. Um, so I studied the brochures very carefully. And I swear to God, this is a true story, even though it seems insane. Um, and I looked at the pictures, and I chose to apply to the school that featured the least weird-looking people. <laughs> um, really, honestly, that's what I did. Um, and I knew I couldn't leave Minnesota. I was paying for my own college. Um, so I knew it was just like the Twin Cities, which was about three hours from my house. And I, was, I applied to this one school, so, you know, marketing sometimes works. The brochure looked nice, and I, it was the University of St. Thomas, a, a Catholic private school in St. Paul, Minnesota. Do we have any Tommies in the house? Okay, we usually do. There's usually one. Um, oh, there's one. Okay, there's a quiet Tommy. Yeah. So I get the letter saying that I'm accepted into school. Um, and I read it to my mom, I'm very happy. And, and this letter says, you know, one little thing, if you decide to go to school here, they didn't know that, that, you know, they were the only game in town for me. If you decide to go, your parents can go to college for free, too. And my mom um, was like 39 or 40 at the time, ancient. Um, and she said, I have always wanted to go to college. And I thought, there is no way in hell you are going with me. Um, I mean, really, I was 17. Like, my main focus in life was to actually be as far away from my mother as possible at all times, right? Um, even though I loved her. And so that was true. I didn't want my mom to go to college with me. But, but one thing that has happened to me over the course of my life over and over again, and it's probably happened to you too, um, is that there's the true thing, which is I didn't want my mom to go to college with me. There's the truer thing, which is even in the midst of my youthful arrogance, I, I knew that my mom had sacrificed everything for us. And I knew that my existence was in part the reason that she didn't ever get to go to college, right? Um, and I also knew the truest thing, which is it's, it's like the basement level. It's like the sub-basement beneath all the stuff that we think we know and want is that I believed in my mom, and I didn't want to be the person to stand between her and that opportunity. So that's how it came to pass, that we were freshmen together, <laughs> my mom and I, <laughs> at, at St. Thomas. And my mom was terrified. She was pretty sure it would be all for nothing anyway, because she was going to probably flunk out, because she wasn't smart. Um, that was the story that she had been telling herself for 40 years and that and that nobody actually intervened to tell her otherwise In fact, I think she probably got that story from the culture um, So she was like well, I'll probably flunk because I don't I'm not smart I don't know even how to write a paper or whatever um, You know, of course she went we, we did have I should, will say, you know, we did have one rule I didn't sacrifice everything um, I we went to this little campus and I lived on campus. She commuted um, she would come down, go to classes, she got her, all her classes like three days a week, and she would drive, make the six hour round trip. Um, but she, um, we had an agreement that should she ever encounter me on this little campus, <laughs> she was not uh, to address me. She was not to, um, you know, and it's so funny, because it's right, right now, I, I have a, a daughter who's about to be 13 and a son who's 14, and I swear it is, it is almost comical, like how it, every, word that comes out of my mouth humiliates my children. Um, my, the other night I went to the Beyonce concert with my daughter and on the way there I said, well, you know, we should go walk around and see if we want any, any merchandise. And she goes, mom, don't say that. And I was like, what? She goes, nobody calls it merchandise. <laughs> and then I said, okay, well, we could shop and get some merch. And she says, don't say that. And I said, what? And she goes, don't say merch, it's merch. Okay, so payback is real, just so you know. Um, so my mother was not allowed to say hello to me. Um, she was not even to linger her gaze upon me, unless, of course, I said hello. Then, then she could address me. I was like the queen of England. You only, you know. So we go to school, and you know what happened is my mom was brilliant. My mom was the best student in all of her classes. She got straight A's. And, you know, the, 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 a portal opened up for her, and a portal opened up for me, too. 
I stepped into the world, I culture hopped, I stepped away from the people who didn't know how to go to college and didn't know people who wrote books and suddenly I was in classes with people who wrote books and my life changed. That's, you know, a lot of people have asked me, how has your life changed after Wild became a hit? That's not when my life changed. My life changed when I was 17 and I went to college. And my mom's life changed too. I couldn't afford to stay at that school. It was a private university and I realized pretty quickly I was gonna be sunk. Um, so I decided to apply to the University of Minnesota and transfer in my sophomore year. And I told my mom, you know, I'm so sorry, but I have to transfer. Um, you know, I can't afford going here. And she was like, you know, that's totally fine, honey. I'll transfer too. And um, <laughs> so she did. <laughs> Thankfully, there's more than one campus. So she went to Duluth, hour and a half from our house, and I went to Minneapolis, St. Paul. And um, we were college students together. In our senior year, when she was 45, she got what she thought was a bad cold. And one thing led to another and she had a chest x-ray, and she was told that she had advanced stage lung cancer, even though she wasn't a smoker, and she was gonna die within the year. Um, she died seven weeks later. She died on the Monday of our senior year of college. She had two classes to take to get her bachelor's degree, um, but she died. And I died too. There was a part of me that felt like, okay, um, my life has also ended, and I can't go on. I can't go on without my mom. And what's, what's, what I've learned in all the years now, my mom has been dead longer than she was alive in my life, and what I learned about that, those two things, my life is over and I can't go on, is I was right about one thing and wrong about the other. Um, the first thing is my life has ended, of course wasn't literally true, but in some figurative way it was true. And I think that one of the most healing things that I did for myself is to finally, you know, a few you know, years later, I'll get to that in a bit, but years later to look back at that and see um, that it was right. You know, the world with, for me, the world without my mom in it is a different world than the one with it, with her in it. And so my work, the way that, the only way that I was going to be able to go on is to accept that was true to accept that I was never going to get her back. And therefore, I had to figure out how to, to survive without her. I had to figure out how to save myself because she wasn't going to save me. She wasn't going to ever be there. And this, you know, this is really about that radical acceptance, I think, of the greatest source of our suffering has been one of the most powerful healing truths of my life. I grieved my mom the way that, that most of us grieve, you know, well and unwell and in constructive ways and destructive ways. I um, was in my early 20s when this happened, so of course it was also during this time of my life when I was, you know, just becoming a woman and trying to find a path. Um, and I got to that point on that highway that I just mentioned when I was driving through the snowstorm and realized I had to change my life about three or four years after my mom died. In those years, I had really started to turn my suffering inward. I did, it was so gigantic, I didn't know what to do with it. And so I started to self-destruct. I started using drugs. I became wildly promiscuous in ways that weren't serving me. I'm not against promiscuity. I think sometimes it's fine. Um, in my case, it was destructive. And what I can see now Looking back at that part of my life, I can see that it was so much an act of love that that stuff that we would associate with somebody who's being really, who's really in trouble. Um, I was trying to honor my mom, who was the most ordinary person in the world. The only time she was even ever in the newspaper was her obituary. I was trying to say to the world, you have to notice. I'm going to make you notice. I'm going to ruin my life to make you notice her absence. And I woke up and realized, no, the opposite is true. I've made a great mistake. That the only way to honor my mom, the only way for the world to ever see my mother is for me to show myself, to show up and become the person she raised me to be. And that's when I really shifted gears. And it wasn't overnight, obviously, you all know. These things are, these, these awakenings, these, these um, sort of spots along the way to enlightenment and transformation and healing are, are, are all very humble, I think, very 
very quiet moments. For me, it was, you know, I had that realization. I was driving through that snowstorm. I went to REI to buy a shovel to dig my truck out of the snow. And um, I thought a tr shovel that folded into itself would be a good idea, and REI sells lots of things that fold into themselves, <laughs> which is why I love them. And um, I was standing in line and saw this guidebook, the Pacific Crest Trail, Volume 1, California. And I just had never heard of the Pacific Crest Trail. I flipped it over. It was at this REI just right outside of Minneapolis. And in this paragraph, it told the story of this long trail uh, that went from Mexico to Canada. And I thought, there was just something in me immediately that just blossomed. I just thought, you know, that would be, that would be something good for me to do. And I think what it was is that there was something so grand and magnificent, magnificent about the beauty of it and the simplicity. The beautiful, magnificent trail at which, and you know, here I am at this moment, honestly, I cannot tell you how deeply I felt like a pile of shit at that moment in my life about myself. I really thought I had ruined my life. I had squandered that ambition. I had squandered my education. When my mom died, I had five classes left to take. And I took four of them and got an incomplete in the last one. So I didn't get my degree. That was another way of saying, you know, fuck you world. And I thought, well, you know, I'm a pile of shit, but this trail is magnificent. And what if I try to attach myself to something bigger and more beautiful and grand than me? What will happen to me? And so I just went on that, that, that sense in my, that truth in my heart, that blooming sense of, of that voice that said, do this. And I, and I decided to, to, to do it. I um, was working as a waitress at, a t at the time in Minneapolis, and I doubled up on my shifts, and I saved my money, and I went to REI, and I bought things that folded into themselves. And, you know, I got to myself to the trail. I, I shut down my life. I got divorced. I got, I, I got married long ago. If you want the full story, you have to read the book. Um, and I got myself there, and I, you know, checked into this motel in the little town of Mojave, California, and I had all of this backpacking gear, and I put it on the bed, and I realized you know, it was the morning of my 1100, beginning of my 1100 mile trek, and I realized this little tiny detail that I'd never gone backpacking before. Um, and I loaded up all that stuff into my pack and couldn't lift my pack. So from the start, it was um, in so many ways, like I had set myself up really against, you know, up against something that would require not only all of my strength, but strength I didn't know I had. And when I was writing Wild years later, it was really that moment in the motel room on day one when I had all that stuff in my pack um, and couldn't lift my pack. And yet what I had to do was lift my pack. It was the only thing I had to do. And it was also the only thing I couldn't do. And when I was writing that, it was years later that I wrote about my hike, I, I, I realized, okay, this, you know, this is a story I have to tell. Um, I didn't write wild because I was so impressed with myself that I went hiking on the Pacific Crest Trail. That is the last reason for anyone to write a memoir or to tell their story. I think that always, like I said at the beginning, when we tell our deepest truth, we're telling the, uni the hum universal human truth. And when I wrote those words about not being able to lift my pack and having to lift my, pa lift my pack, I, f I realized I was writing about the eternal human paradox of suffering that we always have to find a way to bear what we cannot bear. That so much of our work here is about that. To live without the person we can't live without. To be the person we're really afraid of being. To trust the truth that scares us the most deeply. And that's how Wilde was born, that, that, um, that book, trying to write that human truth. And, and in so many ways, it's, um, it's how I was born in that next part of my life, when I said I, my life ended when my mom died, well, my, maybe my life began again when I realized, okay, you can't lift the pack, but you're going to. You can't live without your mother, but you are. And so that's, you know, that's, that's from which all of that sprang. That's what brings me here, I guess, before you today. Um, I did get out the door with my pack. Like I said, if you wanna know everything that happened, including rattlesnakes, bears, interesting men. Read the book. Um, 
I, I, I walked for 94 days. My pack got slightly lighter uh, over time, but not a whole lot lighter. But in a figurative sense, metaphorically speaking, um, the burden that I had to carry uh, did become lighter. And not so much because it went away. And this is what I mean about acceptance. Like I think that the most important thing that I learned on that hike, and I think the most important thing that millions of readers around the world have sort of seen in their own lives when they read my story, is, is this notion of, you know, I think that a lot of us wish that the way to healing was to throw the burden off the side of the mountain, right? So you don't have it anymore. But acceptance, what I've learned about acceptance is that it's really about learning how to carry it. It's saying, you know, the, okay, you, you, this, is, this is the burden that I have for whatever reason, and I'm gonna learn how to carry it with grace, I'm gonna learn how to carry it with a sense of humor, and I'm also gonna learn how to carry it in a way that maybe helps other people carry theirs. Like, I think that that's, to me, the most powerful thing that I've done with my deepest sorrow, is to use it to, sit, to have other people feel less alone in those things that, they're, that they've got to bear. Um, and one of the ways I did that is uh, years, you know, obviously through my, my writing, but years after um, I hiked the PCT and wrote my first book and wrote Wild, I was just finished with Wild, when I was asked to be, to write this advice column called Dear Sugar. How many of you, so Dear Sugar is collected in my book, Tiny Beautiful Things. First of all, how many of you in the room are therapists? Oh my gosh. <laughs> How many of you? That's a lot of, you guys are all like, that's so fun. Okay. Um, <laughs> how many of you are familiar with the Dear Sugar column who have read Tiny Beautiful Things? Okay. So, uh, yes. So I am basically an unqualified you. Um, I was asked to write an advice column. Um, uh, for this website called The Rumpus. This was back in 2010. I had just finished the first draft of Wild, sent it off to my editor, and I was waiting for my editor to write back with notes. And in the meanwhile, I got an email from my friend Steve Ullman, who said, I've been writing this anonymous advice column that nobody reads. It's, um, I do it for this website called The Rumpus, and they can't afford to pay anything, and, I, and not just like hyperbolically anything, actually zero. Um, <laughs> And like nobody's even writing me with their troubles. Would you like to take over the column? <laughs> and since, uh, you know, for whatever reason, I was like, you know, it sounds fun to me, you know. And the great thing about, you know, and then of course I thought, well, wait a minute. Like I never even have gone to therapy. I've never taken a class in psychology. I've never, I don't actually um, have any sort of qualification, right, to, to help people with their troubles. Um, but what I realized, actually, is I had a different kind of, that, that it actually I had really deeply contemplated the human experience all the time for years on end, because that's what a writer does. Uh, like I said, you know, I wasn't writing wild because I wanted you to, tell, to think how glorious I am or that I had suffered more than anyone else or any, anything. I was writing wild because I was really wanting to you know, do the job that an artist does, which is illuminate the human condition to excavate the human condition. And I think that that's exactly the process we go through when we go through therapy, right? Who, not who are you, who are you really? Not what do you think you're supposed to want, what do you want? And those are the deep questions of literature. Those are what we find, on, those, that's what we find on the page, is the, the, the in, interior self. The, inner, the truest inner voice speaking to you, right directly to you from that page. And I've always loved that about literature. Um, and so, you know, I realized that that had prepared me in some ways to really um, use story to take on other people's problems. And I started to do that. One of the most glor glorious things about not being paid um, to do your work is you can do whatever the fuck you want. Um, <laughs> nobody is the boss of you. And so that's what I did. Dear Sugar was born of me sitting there saying, okay, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna go full throttle. I'm gonna use the whole force of my humanity and the full force of my, my strength as a writer to try to really address people who are writing to me very often with their deepest secret, their deepest shame, their deepest source of suffering and bewilderment. bewilderment. And I'm gonna to try to not tell them what to do, but, but further illuminate the questions they're asking. Show them what they're saying to themselves. And so I started doing that. And one of the things that's happened, that was 
um, almost nine years ago now. You know, it's this, the, the sugar morphed into a podcast. I still write a column every Thursday for the New York Times. And um, it's, but what happened is all along the way, even when I took breaks from being Dear Sugar, um, is people keep writing to me. That, that portal is still open on the rumpus even. People write me these long letters. Um, and what's, it's given me is this wonderful opportunity to essentially see you know, what's, what's happening inside of us. What's the truest story? Not the true story or the truest story. The truest story is what I get in those letters, which is what you get in your, your therapy offices and rooms and stuff, right? And it's been a fascinating education in, for me, uh, that I've tried to, to not only apply to my own life, but apply to the advice I give. Um, and I just want to share, before I open up for questions, which I will be doing, um, so if you have them, start thinking of them now. Don't be shy. Um, you know, I really wanted to share with you, I guess, sort of three principles or three values that I think apply across so many kinds of recovery. I know you're all here this weekend talking about recovering from eating disorders. And I think there's so much that um, applies across all kinds of recovery, whether it be recovering from a devastating loss, um, you know, grief, recovering from addiction, recovering from any of the, you know, a, a, a dysfunctional or traumatic childhood, any of those things. And the first one is really just, I think, the simplest one, um, which is trusting your clarity. And I think that um, one of the things that has been most striking to me when I contemplate the hundreds and thousands of letters that I've received to Sugar is that almost always the answer to the question is contained in the letter because the person who is writing to me tells me what they want. They tell me what the, the, the correct course of action would be to address, at least ad address this situation or in some way ease this suffering. And I think that that has been so mind-blowing to me because I've also seen it in my own life. You know, that, that notion of trusting your clarity, it seems so simple, and yet, of course, we know it's so complex. And the reason it's so often so complex is because that truth, that thing that says, here's what I want, is so often in contradiction to the stories we've been told, the voices of, of the culture, the voices of the religion you were raised in, the voices of the, the, the tribal code, of your family or your community or your society, um, the voices of, of essentially uh, affirmation, what's beautiful, what's good, what's perfect, what should you strive for, what shouldn't you do? And I think that it, gets so, it can be so powerful um, to simply say to people, and this is what I, you know, a lot of my advice comes from this place of just saying to people, you know, trust the one thing you know Trust the one true thing you know. Let that be the first passage way to the next thing. You know, that voice, when I picked up that book and said, I want to hike this trail. I think that this trail could lead me to some kind of cure. And, you know, if I hadn't trusted that one inner thing, none of the other things would have come. And, you know, I think that there again, you know, it is um, the truth that that inner voice is the thing at your core. I just last week taught a workshop or a couple weeks ago where this was the first thing we did. And if we had more time, what I would do today, I would make all of you um, do some writing. If we shut these doors and I had you all write a letter right now from your inner clarity, your inner truth, you would all be able to write something you would all be able to write a letter to yourself about a thing that you really actually want or are or know that you aren't making, that you aren't allowing to live in your life. And I think the practice of doing that time and time again, not just once when you're you know, 20, but over and over, is so often, the, 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 like I said, it's the first door you have to walk to, through to, toward enlightenment and healing. The next one, which is so related to this clarity thing, is you know you very much have to revise the narrative, right? You have to revise that story that you've heard about whatever is true. Um, favoring, you know, what revising the narrative is is being an author of your own life, and saying this isn't, you know, this isn't the script I received in my childhood and my youth, but this is the script I'm going to write for myself, which can be an amazingly complicated and, and difficult leap, but it's one, as you all know, I feel kind of funny telling all you guys this, you probably say this to your, your clients, right? 
is that the only way really um, to learn how to bear those burdens we have is to learn how to, 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 do, to live our authentic lives. You know, the truth will not, the, the, the lie will never keep you safe. The truth is the thing that will always set us free when it comes to emotional well-being. And the last one is also connected to that revise your narrative. It's, it's recognize your power and harness it. And I think so many of us, especially women, have been taught that power is a negative thing, that power means domination, that power means, you know, that a kind of like self, selfishness or selfish ambition. But the kind of power I'm talking about is recognizing that almost always in your most broken moments, that's where you actually have access to your deepest strength. One of the things that happened during the course of the movie, I was really involved with um, the making of the movie Wild. D did any of you, who saw the movie? Okay, the book is always better. Um, no, <laughs> I love the movie, I'm teasing. I love the movie and I love race. Um, but I was on the set, I was really involved, and I was watching the most surreal experience of my life, watching Reese pretend to be me, and you know, reenacting some of the, the, the most painful scenes of my life. My, my daughter played me in the film too. So my daughter played the young me, which what a mind trip that was. <laughs> Watching my daughter reenact the man who played my father holding a fist in front of her face and threatening her. Watching Laura Dern with a bloodied face swoop up my daughter and run into the rain in the middle of the night screaming. It was something. I don't have time to tell you about that, but maybe in the Q&A I can. But, um, but, you know, Reese would often talk to me about the role. And one of the things I told her almost every day, you know, when I could see her enacting a kind of like, you know, the Cheryl Strayed who fucked up, the Cheryl Strayed who was shattered, the Cheryl Strayed who, you know, had, you know, used drugs and did this and did, did all the things wrong. And, the, you know, I, I really did not want Wilde to be a false story of transformation. I think for whatever reason we've attached, culturally we have a real attachment to this idea of transformation being that you, that you turn from one thing to the, the exact opposite other, that you begin as Charles Manson and then you become the Buddha. And I was like, no, guess what? I was always me. I was always me. I was me when I was messing up and I was me when I was triumphant. And, and so much of that transformation I went through was, was simply tapping back into who, to my strength. And so I would say to Reese, even when you're, you know, doing things that are the wrong things, always hold in your mind that, that at your bottom moment, when you thought you were a pile of shit, see, I, I get to talk about myself in the third person now. Um, <laughs> you chose, you know, when you were really at the bottom, you had nothing. You would walk past windows, uh, you know, houses with people inside at a dinner party and you would think, I remember when I used to be the kind of person who got to have a dinner party with friends and I am so outside of that now. I don't get access to that now. That's how I felt. But at that moment in my life, my weakest moment in my life, I decided to go hike 1,100 miles of the Pacific Crest Trail by myself. That's fucking amazing, if I do say so. And, and I, the reason I can say so is I know all of you did that too. I know all of you did some version of that too. At whatever moment that you were most sad or afraid or lost or broken or you thought you couldn't do it and did, that's what you did. You tapped into the strength that was yours. You harnessed your power. And I wanted Reese to carry that with her. And I think we need to tell broken people who, in their most broken moment how powerful they actually are. That the journey isn't to finding power. The journey is to realizing it, holding it. One of the best s stories in literature that tells us the truth of this is one of my favorite stories from childhood, which I never read. I only, only saw the movie as a kid, The Wizard of Oz. Um, when I was an adult, I read the book to my kids, and I was just weeping because I was like, my God, I didn't realize like how deeply 
adult and true this story is. Um, you all know the story, Dorothy goes, she's, you know, and she has to encounter like terrible like witches and flying monkeys and trees that try to rape her and like all of these bad things. And the book is much darker than the film. Um, I mean, it's terrifying. And meanwhile, Glinda the Good, Good Witch along the way is kind of like, oh, Dorothy, I love your shoes, you know, and um, <laughs> You can do it. You can. And then she, you, know, you get to the end of the book and all these monstrous things she's passed through. And um, Glinda um, appears. So Dorothy's just like, finally, like, I give up. You know, we have gone for a long way through the dark forest and I'm still not home. I still don't have what I want. Um, my, my clarity of trying to get home has failed me. My revising that narrative of, you know, that I'm not brave enough to go through the woods. I revised that narrative. I went through the woods and I still didn't get what I wanted. And what Glinda says in this moment, and it's a beautiful passage in the book. Um, she says, oh, oh, okay. So you want to go home? All you have to do is click your shoes together three times and say, there's no place like home. And Dorothy, I'm paraphrasing here. She's like, well, why the hell didn't you tell me? You know, <laughs> why didn't you tell me that before? Because, Glinda, cause, cause, you know, at first when Glinda says that, she's like, oh my God, really? Like, did you imbue them with this magical power that now I can go home? And Glinda says, no, they always had that power. The whole time, this whole way that you walked, you always were wearing the magic shoes. You just didn't know what to do with them. And Dorothy says, well, why didn't you tell me? And you wouldn't have believed me. You couldn't have known. You had to go on the journey to know. And I think that that is what we all do, right? We all have to go on the journey to know our power. And I think about that as a sacred act in our own lives, whatever journeys we're on. I also think of that as a sacred act if we are the Glinda of the Good Witch to some people. I'm the Glinda of the Good Witch to some people, you're the Glinda of the Good Witch to some people. Everyone in this room, I think. I think we all are, right? People walk up to me every day and say, you saved my life. And what I always think is, you saved your own life. But okay, I did have a little bit of a Glinda wand. <laughs> and I think that that's just a beautiful, you know, way, I think, to reckon with both um, the, the power with which we're imbued when we are the witch, um, but also the power we have within ourselves when we think we're in the darkest wood and we lo we've lost our way. So I'm going to open it up for questions now. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. So there are microphones on either side of the room. Look at you guys, not shy at all. Okay, who, who were you, are you, yeah, why don't you ask, there. You wanna go okay. first? Go ahead, I'm just Hello. Hi, I really admire your work. I've listened to Dear Sugars regularly. Thank you. As well as Love Wild and your story. Um, I recall re uh, listening to one of the episodes when you talk and dedicate time to body image. And as an eating disorder professional, I was very excited about that particular episode. And I would love to hear you speak a little bit more specifically about the retouching of photos as it happened to you mm. and the editing. And what do you generally think about that topic and how people, and especially women, are portrayed in the media? Thank yeah, you. yeah. Wow. You know, like a lot of people, I mean, all of that, that body image stuff, I think it's almost impossible um, to be a human, but especially to be a girl or a woman in our culture. And, and, and you know, just from the get-go, have a healthy sense of your body. Um, and especially, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm 50. I grew up in times where, you know, there was no conversation about body positivity whatsoever. And, um, I actually recently had a very interesting experience around this. Like I said, I turned 50 last month, and I, I grew up in this little town in northern Minnesota, and, some, and, and I left that place. Like, I've not seen most of those people I went to high school with for, you know, a long time, 30 years or something. And um, we, but several of my girlfriends who I had back in the day, many who I haven't seen for decades, said, let's get together. It was like five of us. Let's get together. And um, since we all turned 50, and just like spend a night together and talk. So we did, we convened on the Oregon coast. And I said to all of them, 
Oh, you know, I, well, the thing I regret is I spent so much time with my boyfriend. All through high school, I had this serious boyfriend. And I kind of abandoned, I did the thing that a lot of people do. They abandoned their friends so that they can be with this dude, this guy. And I was like, I regret that. I wish I had spent more time with you all. And I thought that they would all be like, yeah, you little bitch. Why did you do that to us? <laughs> and um, what they said to me, which really took me aback, is they said, you know, oh, that wasn't, that wasn't the thing that I felt distanced us. What, what we were all freaked out about, what distanced us from you, is when you stopped eating. And I was like, what? Um, because all through my teen years, I basically starved myself. I weighed, you know, I was this tall and I weighed half of what I weigh now. And the teachers and nurses and peop people in the school system would intervene and send me to the nurse and weigh me and talk to me about eating. And, but this was the very beginning of the days when we even talked about eating disorders or, you know, it was kind of like a positive if you were anorexic, you know, it was like, oh, she, I got a lot of congratulations for being thin. And what I didn't realize until here I am 50, my girlfriend's saying, that isolated you from us. That cut you off from us because we didn't know how to even talk to you. And, you know, that was a problem I solved myself as I grew up into my 20s and, and, and really essentially reckoned with it myself. But, you know, I, I, I reflected on that when I think about now where I am. You know, all of my life there's been some version of me trying to be okay with the body I'm in. And what I wanted to do in that podcast, I don't know where the woman is who wrote the, who asked the question, but in the podcast episode about body positivity was really just to sort of you know, not just break the silence around eating disorders, but the whole continuum of struggles that so many of us have with being okay with, with who we are in the world. Um, I think it's such a powerful, I mean, I, one of the most things I'm most grateful for that I think has really shifted in our culture, especially in the last few years, is any kind of notion of like this idea of body positivity, any kind of opening of the conversation, widening of the perspective, of what we can be and look like. You know, Cara is doing some of that amazing work. A lot of you in the room are doing some of that amazing work. And I think for me personally, it's a constant, it's that thing that I just talked to you about, you know, having to constantly work on trusting my clarity and revising the narrative and, and doing the things, you know, living out the truth that's in me, which is I believe um, that I'm worthy even if I don't always feel like I look like that. And I think that that's, you know, an ever an ongoing struggle. And, you know, for you all to be here and be, you know, expanding this conversation about these issues, you're changing the world. It's revolutionary and it's so necessary. So thank you. Yes, question. Hello. Yes, it's such an honor to be in the same room with you. I've hiked oh, the you. parts of the Pacific Rim Trail and, and felt that parts of you were with me. Awesome. Is that what that your T-shirt said? Does your T-shirt say something like <laughs> no, that? No, it's oh, okay. my college. Who is you just were like today. so cheery, yeah. And is behind. But anyway, so I use hiking to clear my mind yes. and work through my thoughts. And I, my question for you is, do you enjoy hiking and do you still use that for your own therapy? Yes. Hiking is my therapy. Hiking and writing. I do think that there's nothing, uh, there, there's something really important, whether it be hiking or doing something alone, um, without the distraction of the internet. Remember that, that when we didn't all have phones in our pockets all the time? Um, I think that, that that's the, the great thing that hiking gives me, you know, just to be alone with my thoughts and the, the kind of rhythm of nature, yeah. More questions? Nobody's at the microphone, you guys. Are you shy? You have to go to the mic, can you, can, or you can shout it out, I'll repeat it. How are you today? How am I today? How am I? I'm good, that's so nice of you to ask. You know, I'm having some kind of like Denver eye, is anyone else getting like dry eyes or something? Is this, is this a Denver thing? Okay, okay, because I'm like, just in case, like my eyes are all watery and it's not that I'm crying, I'm, I'm, I'm just watery, yeah. But otherwise good, I'm excited to be with you all. I need therapy, does anyone? <laughs> anyone want to volunteer for that? Um, yes. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm not a therapist, so oh, okay. one day. Um, I just wanted to know, uh, I personally lost someone um, who's the most important person in my life about three years ago, and I kind of wanted to know how did you walking on that trail, like how has that affected you today, like the feeling of um, being shattered inside? 
Right. How does... Well, you know, in so many... I think that one of the most powerful things we can do for ourselves when we feel shattered and weak is to do things that are strong, even if we don't feel strong inside, you know? Um, to say, who is going to be my ruler today? Is it going to be my sorrow? Is it going to be my fear? Is it going to be that badass voice in, within me that says, we can do this? And it, every time I do that, it makes me a little more okay. It does. And so I, I try to, you know, so much I think for myself, and you know, I, I, I'm going to guess for other people too, is, is about that, you know, being mindful of, you know, what are those voices inside of you saying to you? And what, what other voice can you muster? This is what I mean when I say trust your clarities. You know, tune into that truest, most loving voice in you and listen to that one, even if, even if you're bewildered, even if it scares you. Um, that one will never lead you in the wrong direction. Thank, Thank you. you. Good luck. Hi. Hi. So, um, I can't tell how loud I am. Um, a few years ago, I was working with a, an adolescent patient, and I can't remember why, but I shared with her your essay around um, choosing Van Gogh. And... Um, she was working through trauma, but she was also, you know, dealing with her eating disorder. And we were talking about this concept of being intentional and, you know, you can choose to, um, you know, essentially let your life be defined by these bad things that have happened to you um, or by the eating disorder, or you can choose what's more meaningful to you. Um, and she actually called me a few days ago and shared that she um, got a tattoo that said choose Van Gogh. And I think she might have met you at some point um, to share that with you and that's, it's, you know, been a few years but that's really stuck with her. She says every day she thinks about that. Choose oh, Van that's Gogh. wonderful. Um, I love that. I love, there's so many tattoos out there. I love that. I'm sure. I want to like make a whole book. That'll, maybe that could be my next book. Just photographs of Cheryl Strayed tattoos so I don't yeah. have to write another book. Yeah. So my question, and you, you kind of just answered it, I think, a little yeah. bit, but I'm wondering what you, what kind of mantras or mottos you have, like what do you go to throughout the day to keep you grounded and, and focused on? Yeah, I mean, I do. This is, I mean, it's my actual be best advice. It's my number one thing that I draw upon when I am struggling with anything large and small, is really getting, it's about, it's about getting conscious. It's about saying, Okay, I know that I feel these, these ways. And, you know, I think so often we use these terms like fearlessness and, you know, da da da, da like all, you know, it's like, and we think like, that means somebody who doesn't have any fear. And what I learned early on, like to even be able to go and hike the Pacific Crest Trail by myself, I was like, okay, fear will be present. So, you know, greet fear and say, now what am I gonna do with you? Are you gonna be the boss of me for the rest of my life or not? Um, and I know the answer to that is not. But I'm, I'm also going to have to reckon with you probably every day. So take a seat. You get to sit at the table. You're there. You know, and then, but I'm the one, I'm at the, the that, that voice of inner truth, the, love, the loving kindness voice is the one who's going to steer this ship. The one who's the bravest is going to steer this sh ship. The one who does, the, you know, as often as possible, the most generous thing is going to steer this ship. And I think really bringing that to consciousness is very powerful. And even just, I don't know if any of you follow me on, on social media, but so last week I was in, let's see, I'm like, yeah, last week I, I flew to Orlando to give a talk. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I am going to be in Orlando in this nice hotel and they have this beautiful swimming pool. And um, I get to the hotel and I had an afternoon to swim and I just thought, you know, I'm so fat and I have this stupid mom suit. And everyone at the pool is going to look at me and be like, who's that frumpy, stupid person? And oh no, what if people recognize me and they're like, oh my God, Cheryl Strait is actually a really stupid, frumpy person in that mom suit. Like that was, that was the voice in my head. And I just said, hey, old friend, um, sit down, <laughs> take a seat. You've been duly heard. And now I'm going to get in my swimsuit and I'm going to go swimming. And... <laughs> Yeah. 
and maybe, maybe to you guys, it, this doesn't sound crazy, but it's, it's actually went on, what went on in my head. Like, I actually had to say, and also, where did that voice come from? Where did that voice come from? And that's about revising the narrative. I know exactly where that voice came from. That voice comes from that, that you know, essentially the male gaze that women are, are subjected to all of our lives. You know, are we, are we thin? Are we pretty? Are we, you know, and what, what I noticed when I said, you know, this suit isn't frumpy, it's just my swimsuit, is it's a lot like the swimsuits that men get to wear. It covers my ass. <laughs> it doesn't put my dot body on display. It, it actually covers, you know, my main parts. And um, it's, it's comfortable. I can walk through the hallways without you know, getting arrested for public nudity. Um, <laughs> and I did that. So that's an example of the way, on a micro scale, that's how I heal. I mean, that's how I try to slowly heal myself every day. Yes. Thank you for, well, thanks for being here with us and <laughs> being you. an advocate for truth. Um, you already answered a little bit of what I'm gonna ask because it's about fear. Where did and I get my swimsuit? Exactly, no. yeah. <laughs> Where did you get your swimsuit? Land's End. I know, okay. so then I, I no, I, I want to finish the swimsuit story, because then I okay, was like, go ahead. oh, and the real badass is now going to take a photo of herself in the swimsuit and put it onto my social media and say what I just told you. And you know, thousands of people have been like, me too, thank you, me too, thank you. Elsa, where'd you get that swimsuit? Um, Land's End makes great swimsuits for just like all kinds of people, yes. So yesterday in one of the intensive sessions, we were having a conversation about fear, the blocks that we have as therapists that keep us from maybe going all the way, going full throttle, like you were able to do in your letters with your sugar. And would just love to hear what was your, I, you and Steve on the podcast talked about overcoming some of those barriers, knowing you're speaking into people's lives and kind of how did you process that? Any fear that might've been present um, and that you still said, I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want. <laughs> right. Yeah. In your work. I mean, it is, it's interesting, so many therapists have talked to me about tiny beautiful things uh, and said, you know, what you can do in this column, I can't quite do in my practice because you guys are actually bound by like laws and stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, but um, you know, so there is, it's is true that I have a different, you know, obviously I have a different kind of um, forum than you do, but I, but I think I know what you're talking about, like that there's, I still feel like, and I don't just write whatever the hell I want. Like I have an absolute, um, I search my soul all the time. Um, I know the stakes are high. Uh, even when I say, look, I'm only one source of advice. You're asking me, I, I'm not the authority on anything. I don't think anyone's the authority on anything except yourself, right? And yet, you know, I, I understand that, that sometimes, you know, words have power and I would never, um, you know, tell somebody they have to do something um, if I thought that there was any risk I guess, in me telling them that. And, but on the other hand, I think sometimes that you do have to, um, you know, for myself, what I've decided is, you know, when, when, I'm, when I'm certain that what I'm telling them echoes what they know to be their truth, um, that my job isn't to tell them what to do, but to, to, to deepen their, their, their sense of their own wisdom and maybe to enlighten and shed light on other areas that they're maybe they're not looking at that are sort of adjacent to that, um, that thing they're presenting as the problem. That oftentimes, as you all know, what's the, the, the problem that's presented is really connected more deeply to so many other things. And so what I'm always asking people to do is dig deeper, endeavor, dig, endeavor, um, before, you know, that it's not so much about what they're gonna do, it's what they're gonna, what they're gonna seek inside of themselves. Yes, I think we have one time for one more. Yes, cool. Um, I'm the one who asked you how you were doing, and I was hoping you would like pick up my bait a little bit, but I'll explain. So um, I'm a registered dietitian, and I specialize in working with clients with eating disorders. And a lot of times over the past couple years, specifically women will come into my office and sit across from me, and they're like, God, things are fucking hard. And I'm like, oh, what's going on? And they look at me like I have three eyes, because they're like, are you watching the news? Oh, yeah. No, I'm and, terrible. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I immediately am like, oh, wait, yeah. Holy shit. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm watching. Shit, this is hard. And I wonder if you have something to say. Like, this is literally what I wanted to write in when I heard, before I heard that Dear Sugar was ending the podcast, is for caregivers. I'm sure there are a lot of women and men in this room who don't feel like the world is ending, but I know there are a lot of women and men in this room who do. And I struggle with sitting across from my clients for whom the current climate and culture 
is the reason they are using the behaviors they are using. Yeah, no, I know. Um, so I'm just putting that out there. I hope you're doing well. Yeah, no, it's, we, I mean, like I said, I'm still, I still get all kinds of letters um, because of the, I still write a column that's in the Sunday style section, the New York Times, or I mean, not Sunday, Thursday style section. And yeah, we're flooded with um, questions. And of course, everyone I know, all of my friends, my women friends especially, but even some men, you know, are, are quite, um, I mean, furious, but traumatized. And I think anyone who has been, um, sexually abused or assaulted, or even frankly, I mean, I think one of the most things that's really making so many women so furious is, is even if you, if your story isn't that you were sexually assaulted as a teenager, you certainly grew up in a culture that made light of sexual assault, that made it okay for boys to do everything from snap your bra to mock you if you got boobs in seventh grade to, you know, like that was all, um, acceptable behavior. And we know this, we have evidence of this in the movies that were popular in the day. I, I watched, I, I, a couple of years ago, I thought I was doing some glorious mother-daughter cool thing by watching Grease with my daughter because I watched it when I was like 10 and I remember saying to my mom, um, that is the best movie I've ever seen in my whole life. Um, and so I said to my daughter, oh my God, do you wanna see like the best movie you've ever seen? And then we're watching it and I'm just horrified. And, and I'm horrified that I wasn't horrified then. And my mom wasn't. And it wasn't that, and the culture wasn't. And it wasn't like, because any of us are bad people. It's because that's, those are the, that's the story we were told. This is what we're talking about when we're revising the narrative. And the thing that, you know, just from the, the standpoint of emotional well-being, um, the thing that maybe makes me the most sad about what's happened with this whole Kavanaugh stuff is, is uh, that, wouldn't it, what a world, what, what, how would the world break open if what had happened instead is that Kavanaugh and, and many of the men of his generation said, you know what, I did do that stuff. That stuff happened. This is the way we treated girls and women. And, and, and it was because we were taught to treat girls and women that way. And we were allowed to treat girls and women that way. And that's the truth. It's not because like he's some sort of evil person who's like a predator, you know, preying on women. It's because that was the culture. I mean, we see it on the pages of his yearbook. It's not a. It's not like doesn't come out of thin air that a bunch of boys, you know, like you know, name, you know, talk about the Renata Club or whatever. We all know what that is. We were all. We all went to, you know, we were all teenagers. We were either the people who did that to somebody else, or that was done to us, or both. And so, you know, I think that there's a, there's a place for understanding and forgiveness, but never until we start telling the truth about it. And I am heart sick and enraged, but here is the great hope. We're having this conversation. It has begun. It is ugly right now. It is gnarly right now. We are not doing it the right way, but we are having the conversation. We were not doing that five years ago or 10 years ago. We weren't. It wasn't even... It, wasn't even, it didn't even occur to us. So, so now it's on a level that's risen to consciousness. So what gives me hope always is once, once, you get, once you get consciousness about something, the world cracks open, your life cracks open, and there's always you know, the glorious what happens next. So I keep faith with that. Thank you.